but we'll, we'll, we might make a start. Um, so I might just... Um, oh, okay. Come in. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country who we gather here tonight um, and to thank them for the opportunities that we have to come together um, to listen, to talk, to share with each other and to learn with each other. Um, I also want to acknowledge our elders, past and present, our Indigenous and our non-Indigenous elders, and thank you for taking the time during this week to come and be a part of this conversation. Um, it's important that we have opportunities to come and talk about particular things, um, particular things that drive us, that give us passion, um, but also things that allow us to be able to share parts of our community, parts of our culture with you. Um, this is what the Night by the Fire forums are about. They're very informal, they're very relaxed, um, they're not rigid, um, there's a little bit of freedom, not too much. No, there is a little bit of freedom, Stephen, just a little bit. <laughs> um, but there's also opportunity to, um, for you to be a part of the conversation and for you to be a part of what's happening here um, on, on stage. So at times of the night where you feel you have a burning desire to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll do the best we can to run a microphone to you. So um, if you need to go to the toilet, um, if you walk outside the door to your right, the toilets are there anytime, hop up and down. If you need to get another cup of tea or coffee in the next half hour, the tea will be set up there as well. Um, I do ask that people turn off their, um, either turn your microphones on to silent. Microphones? microphones? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, turn your mobile phones on silent, vibrate, whatever makes you happy. Um, and for you to also know that tonight's um, conversation is being recorded by the State Library of Queensland and will be podcast. It's also being recorded by Radio National um, and the sound cast will be available through Radio National. So if you do have a question to ask, um, be aware that your voice um, and you might, might like to identify yourself when you ask the question, like the voice. Just don't sing. <laughs> or you can sing if you're a singer. Um, so that's kind of the, the general housekeeping stuff. Um, before we get into the conversation, I just want to um, also acknowledge that this is National Reconciliation Week. Um, yesterday was the National Sorry Day, and today is the 43rd anniversary of the 1967 referendum. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening in this one week, finishing up with Mabo Day, that are really important to members of our community, and it's really interesting that it's been swallowed up in the, in the budget conversation. But, um, you know, always be aware that uh, these, these moments of time and history in Australia have shaped who we are today, um, and will continue to shape who we are as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people um, moving forward together in reconciliation or whatever you like to call it. Um, in saying that, welcome to the evolution of storytelling. Sounds a little bit sci-fi. <laughs> Could turn out like that by 8 o'clock tonight, you never know. Um, but I did actually want to start the, the, the forum off with, um, oh, a quick clip to get us thinking. Now, I have to work technology, and i kind of not good at it. Play. No, face. Yeah, if the panel wants to, if you want to sit and watch, or Aunty Mary, you're right. Yep. Just watch them chairs, they snap up. In the future, the history books will study us. Our cities will have been renamed. Our language is slanged into something new. And this moment will one day be ancient. The future ancients dig theoretical trenches between settlement and invasion, shoot rifles at each other from across the plains and place prayers within the screaming bullets. They shroud their heads in mourning and afterwards line their soldiers up in cemeteries like voodoo dolls for God. The future ancients will be encased behind glass in museums Greek ragtag squadrons with backpacks, gas masks and shards of Athenian columns for weapons will be installed in exhibitions of either terrorists or freedom fighters, depending on who it is that wins this time. They will stand side 
by side with wax dummies of good men in shirts and ties who never leave their suburban blocks but are called to duty through computer screens shooting unmanned cannons in faraway places and are called things like husband, son, sweetheart and lieutenant. The future ancients will have their artifacts locked in storage. Shards of Molotov cocktails from the Egyptian revolution will be tagged and filed next to Michael Jackson albums, smartphones, Playboy magazines, and the Australian flag. The future ancients will be found by future archeologists preserved and embalmed in tequila and Chanel number no. five, alongside pop star prophets who thought they were somehow saying something new. This time, they will find them praying to gods who believe in science on a planet of do's and don'ts of factions and fractions of us's and them's and we's and whatever's and maybe never's and never again's the future ancients will be found in tombs of cheap liquor and databases of tradition on screens called culture as relics of broken signals that will hardly be visited as bones but remembered in the symbology of pixel and paranoia the future ancients will be remembered or lost depending on what we decide. Since democracy has been paraphrased, sustainability called primitive, refugees criminalized by the first invaders and indigenous cultures lined up side by suicide in prisons like voodoo dolls for the future, the textbooks will study us. Our cities will have been renamed, our languages slanged into something new and our stories will be the only link left between objects and their meanings. They will try to twist and turn our histories based on what they find of us. So our voices are the only artifacts worth keeping alive. So whose lips will we honor? On whose tomb will we lay our tears? Those that risked everything to speak but spoke anyway. Those that gave meaning in the darkness. Those who not only spoke but gifted us a moment of silence in this madness so that we could learn to hear ourselves. Those thoughts are your artifacts. The jewelry, jade, and bronze. And your words are your monuments, your stone and bone, Parthenon and Colosseum, everything worth leaving behind. And silence is how we surrender. Speech is the architecture of fate. So are we pharaohs of fallacies, empresses of nothing? What will they engrave beneath our statues? in the ancient future. So that was a poem written by Luke Lesson. And I think there's just some really interesting themes that, came, that come out of that. Um, and we'll talk about that um, with the panel, who I will now introduce you to. Um, I would like to introduce you to our panel this evening. Um, and I will start with Arnie Mary Graham, the only lovely lady on our panel tonight. Um, Arnie Graham has a career spanning more than 30 years. Um, Arnie Mary has worked across several government agencies, community organisations and universities. She has been a dedicated lecturer with the University of Queensland teaching Aboriginal history, politics and comparative philosophy. Arnie Mary has also lectured nationally on these subjects and developed, developed and implemented the core university subjects of Aboriginal perspectives, Aboriginal approaches to knowledge and at the post-graduation level, Aboriginal politics. Ani Mary has written and published many prominent works and is a proud member of the Ethics Council for the National Congress of Australia's First Nations. Um, sitting next to me is Stephen Oliver. I had a short bio for Stephen, but now I've got the longest one in history. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Stephen was born in Kwankari, northwest Queensland, and grew up in Townsville. He is a descendant of the Kukuyalanji, Wanyi, Wapabara, Bunjalung, Gangalita, and Biripai peoples. He was accepted into the Aboriginal Music Theatre Training Program in Perth and featured his studies, featured, furthered his studies at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts studying music theatre. He has been involved in various festivals throughout Australia and is currently residing in Brisbane and focusing on his writing. 
His musical Black Queen, Black King has had showings at the Queensland Theatre Company as well as the Brisbane Powerhouse as part of World Theatre Festival and his play Proper Solid is being produced by Duke Theatre Company in Cairns this year. He's also a published poet with works in the literary journal Oranui as well as the soon-to-be-released digital publication Writing Black. He has been performing his poetry in and out and around Brisbane and, and currently has works being played on 98.9 in an effort to further educate people about issues faced by Aboriginal Australia. He's recently finished working on the TV comedy sketch show Black Comedy as a writer, actor and producer, which is to air on ABC later this year. <laughs> Time for a break. Um, sitting next to Arnie Mary is Fred Leone. Fred is a groundbreaking Australian Indigenous hip-hop artist, frontman of Impossible Odds and founder of Queensland's only Indigenous-owned and operated record label, Impossible Odds Records. A well-respected community leader with strong Australian Aboriginal, Tongan and South Sea Islander heritage, Fred and his family come from the Garawa, Wanyi and Butchala mobs. Fred recently curated the closing ceremony of the Clancestry event at QPAC in early March this year a corroboree featuring, featuring over 160 dancers from nine distinct clan groups, a site not seen or recorded in Brisbane since the 1920s. He has developed his 14-year career working across the Australian hip-hop scene, community cultural development, education and new sectors become an established MC, arts and cultural facilitator, educator, youth worker and creative producer. Fred is passionate about and committed to social change and social justice, particularly applying his skills and knowledge to support the strength, status and development of Indigenous culture. And Fred's really nervous tonight, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> so ask him all the hard questions. <laughs> and finally, sitting next to Fred is Tibian Wiles. Emerging Brisbane actor Tibian Wiles is quickly making himself known in the entertainment industry. With three years of training under his belt from the Aboriginal Centre for the Performing Arts, Tibian has enjoyed the recent success of the Sydney tour of Black Diggers, Queensland Theatre Company's latest production scheduled to open in Brisbane in September during the Brisbane Festival. Tibian boasts a multitude of dance and music performances accompanying his growing acting portfolio. He has performed at major events including the Byron Bay Blues Festival, Queensland Performing Arts Centre's annual Clancestry events, Sydney Festival and many more. When he's not on stage, Tibian engages with Indigenous youth through workshops and forums and was recently named an ambassador for Digi Youth Arts Organisation. So join me in welcoming our last three panel. Are you clapping yourself, Steve? That's lovely. <laughs> So tonight's discussion forum is about the evolution of storytelling. So the idea was of the, the video clip that we showed um, was to start thinking about the stories that we tell today, what will they tell about us in the future? Um, the stories that we tell today, what did our ancestors think that they would tell us in today's world? So there's a lot of um, you know, conversations around you know, the stories that we create, they're our legacy. So what is the importance of storytelling? Have the age-old traditions of storytelling being an intimate one-on-one -on -one exchange been lost in this evolution of technology in the digital world, which is now getting our stories out to millions, whereas it may have only been a little mob in the past? So um, they're big questions, um, and I think each of our panels will give their own interpretation to these questions because they each come from a different background of storytelling and a different form of storytelling. So to start, because we've each I've been asking people about their stories and you know some of the questions that were posted on Facebook and outside is like your most memorable story. What is your the the most memorable story that you've either been told or experienced, and why? So I'm going to start with you, Arnie Mary Graham. Um, oh, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners from. Um, from this um, part of Brisbane, um, the Turbal and Jagra people. Um, and to thank you very much for asking, uh, f uh, inviting me to present um, too on this uh, panel. <laughs> um, uh, this I was wondering about how to answer this um, because it's to me like memories, um, 
in in my mind uh, in a way they're, they're not words they're actually like um, uh, different um, a splash of colors and movement and actions and so on and they're all kind of mixed up do you know they, they um, cover each other and so on and so on um, but um, I vaguely remember a lot of the older stories the parents um, gave um, so first of all I'll say um, my on my own my mother's side is Waka Waka. Uh, she was um, born uh, on St Albans. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Auburn Station. <laughs> St Auburn, Auburn Station. Um, but she was a child on what she called Baramba, um, which later became um, Sherbu. And my father's side, I grew up in my father's people's area down the Gold Coast, Waka Waka. Um, so I heard stories from, from both sides. Um, some traditional stories, stretch traditional stories, and of course family histories and so on. But the, I, s I guess the one, the one that has stuck in my mind um, out of all of them uh, is a later one that I found, which is actually quite a true story. It was about um, the very early days down the Gold Coast where um, there were um, shooting parties, you know, more or less, which happened all over the whole country, shooting parties of whitefellas going out, sort of clearing the land, basically, of uh, us as, um, you know, Aboriginal people as uh, pests, you know, uh, noxious pests and so on. So every now and then they do that, but it was very strange that down there, the people who settled there, whitefellas who settled there, were English and Scottish and German, German peoples. Um, and on a... On a um, day when there was a shootout, you know, shooting party was out and about. Um, so people would be running for their lives, you know, um, looking for safety. They could find safety uh, within the, the barns or, you know, the farms and the or barns um, of the German settlers, actually, oddly enough, you know. They didn't all take part in it. Only, only the English and the Scottish were the ones who were doing the, the killing. But you could find they would the German settlers they would hide Aboriginal people under the houses or in the barns or something like that until it passed, until the next time came around, you know, and so on. And it always that really really struck me. It's a it's a anecdotal story, you know. It's passed down, mm. so nothing is written about it. But that's what happened down there. Um, and the strange thing is that um, this is the story, I suppose. Uh, people who were young then were older during the Second World War. They were very young. So that during the Second World War, they're elderly, and the people who are young during the Second World War, who are now in their 80s, you mm -hmm. know, and gradually sort of passing on, they remembered those old people as talking, um, talking about um, the news that was coming in from Europe about concentration camps being opened up, you know, and terrible, terrible, you know, the stories about the Holocaust and all that kind of stuff. Well, these, these old people, they wouldn't believe anything bad said about Germans. Oh, no, no, Germans wouldn't do anything like that. They couldn't read or write, you know, they the news was being read out to them kind of thing. Uh, they're still speaking their own language and so on. But they, um, they, they just would not believe it. And then, you know, the young people are saying, oh, look, here's pictures, you know, of, you know, terrible skeletal figures and all that sort of thing. They just wouldn't have it. And so those old people, they still tell that story now that they're, you know, they're in their 80s and so on. That really struck me as an amazing story. You and know, it's um, never and it's been real. Written, but it's never been told. written. It's just told. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but and why? You know, I don't. It's a <coughs> question mark about why the Germans went against German settlers. Didn't do what the English were doing. You know, I kind of, I, I couldn't. Not to take away from their ethics for doing that. You know, obviously, but it was just interesting. Very interesting. Mm. And it just struck me that, and when I first heard that story about um, the whole thing of history, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, if you look at the whole history, especially uh, not just European history, of course, the histories of a whole lot of cultures, I suppose, is one one minute, or ra rather one century, or one period of time, these are the bad fellas, do you know what I mean? And they've done terrible things. And the next century, it's somebody else is doing <laughs> terrible things. Mm. And this century, who knows? Nobody knows what's going to happen, mm. eh? Mm. Um, but it just goes on like that. Like, it mm. takes, everybody takes a turn in being mm. kind of totally uncivilised in, mm. in that way, you know. Kind <laughs> of, I don't know, it's just interesting. Anyway, that's that's what stuck, struck me when I was... Great. When we put it up. Thank you, young lady. Tibian. <laughs> ah, sitting there relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so what's one of those memorable stories that you know and you've felt? Um, I guess uh, 
it would have to be recently too, just before we started Black Diggers, because before I was ever um, auditioned for Black Diggers, I didn't really know that there were Aboriginal soldiers that went to World War One, because uh, of of the stories that I've heard that how Aboriginal peoples were treated back then. Mm. So um, yeah, I didn't really think there were as much as I thought there were. So um, the story there was um, Uncle George. He's one of the nine actors in the cast, Uncle George Bostock, he he told us because he can tell stories about about him being in the in the in the World War Two because he's he was in the Viet uh, the Viet was it Vietnam, Vietnam one mm -hmm. yeah he was in that and he told us stories about his experience when he was in on the battlefield and the stories he told us it kind of draw me draw drew all of us young men in to wanting to do the play um, with with more, um, I guess, with with more passion in what we were doing mm. and as we were telling the stories of these soldiers and what they've been through. So um, I guess, yeah, the stories of Uncle George told us, I can't really remember what he told us about stories, but they were really, really, like, they were really good, I guess. Personal. Say. Yeah, they yeah, really, yeah. not good, but yeah, just yeah. interesting. And if anyone knows Uncle George, he's got a lot of stories to tell. Yes, yeah. he does. <laughs> he tells a lot. Yeah. In a good way. In a good way, yes. Yeah. Um, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Um, it was funny, yeah, when I saw that question and one story instantly came to mind. But um, it was funny listening to Annie Mary just talk to him, though, too, because when she was talking about the old people talking, and it actually just took me back to a time when... Um, when we were children and our old people would always talk about um, stuff like Harry Men and Bear the Foot if us kids were being bad. They had all these stories <laughs> that kind of kept us in check and, you know, would make us jam up to, um, you know, not climb trees at night time and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the story, <laughs> it's kind of, well, I mean, it's a, it's a true story. It's a funny story. But um, that sticks out for me. It was actually um, a personal experience when I was... 17 years old and I was in Townsville and um, anyway auntie while I'm standing at the front there like I was just leaning up against the fence you know looking out on the road and um, auntie was there sweeping up the stairs and next minute you know I heard this doom, doo -doo 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 -doo. so I look around and here a broom went flying one way auntie there laying at the bottom of the stairs yeah. legs up in the air and um, no good another auntie come running out and she reckoned, hey, what happened? What happened? You're right, you're right. Yeah, put some pants on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story that pops into my head. <laughs> oh, shame. Oh, how that's oh, connected don't. to Featherfoot, I don't oh, know. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's, terrible. <laughs> that's terrible, Stephen. But thank you for the sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fred. Yeah. Um, own a story that's touched you. Yes. Similar to Brother Man there, Junjiri. <laughs> no, 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 not that one, not that one. <laughs> You're all getting visuals. No, <laughs> not that one, another one, uh, Junjiri. So, mm. you know, all the old, old girls sitting around playing cards. You know, we're playing Tiggy, making a big noise, you know, all about 10, 11, running around. And the old girl across the road apparently had a Junjiri. And she would say, Go on, uh, last time, and then I'm going to get him to come out and get you's. And we, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, unless there was something in the water that night, but all of us saw something pretty creepy, and everybody still talks about it to this day, <laughs> little hairy <laughs> fella running around <laughs> in the yard. Yeah. You know? But that wasn't the story. The, the, the actual story, that I've, I, that was one that you reminded me of. But um, the story was when I, um, it was a bit of a story, it was more like a warning, when I, when I got old enough to go away from home, and I think I w if the first time was... I was going on a bus trip, it was NAIDOC, and they had about eight different schools, all the Murray kids from all these different schools were getting in coaches, uh, taking everybody around this tour down the coast, going all these ball rings and that. And it was the first time I heard mum, I remember it was around then or just before, she must have known that trip was coming up or I was going somewhere else where I had to go to someone else's country. And if you don't know, if you don't know about Blackfellas country, there's all different countries, this is not my country, my country is like Europe. We're all split up in a different region, see? Mm -hmm. So this isn't my country, but mum 
told me when I was about to go on this trip. She said, oh, you make, she goes, remember this for the rest of your life and I'll only tell you once. And she goes, and you just tell your kids when they get old enough, when they're going to go. I said, oh, what's that? And she said, you make sure that you acknowledge all those old people where you're going and let them know who you are and where you come from. She said, because if you don't, she said, something bad will happen to you. And she was told that by her father and he was told that by his mm. father, you know, so it got passed down. The language might have changed, but that story is passed on. A lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of black fellows know about that. Mm. Yeah, mm. so that's one that's stuck in my head. Yeah. So yeah, it's those, yeah. and and we've asked some people outside about the what gets you into a story, like, you know, what, why is storytelling so important? Is it just the telling of stories? But it's that kind of thing, it connects us to something, whether it connects us to a person or a place or a time or a, or a, a space. It's about history, the learnings, and like Auntie Mary was saying, not necessarily everything is written. So how is it that we keep traditions alive if they're not written? Mm. Um, and also, um, other people have written down, it's about character, action, romance. This is what gets you into a story. Not every story has romance, but it could have. <laughs> um, heart, message and honesty, and it piques my interest. Then there's also that personal connection, which I think is what sucks us in mm. to a, a really good storyteller, be it whatever form they choose to, to tell their stories. So in saying that, mm. what is our role as Indigenous storytellers? Do we write mm. stories for ourselves or do we write stories for others or create stories, tell stories for others? As Indigenous people? Sorry, yeah. as Indigenous people? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah. Could, um, could I say that I, I've always thought of storytelling as um, <coughs> it's like asking what the what the purpose of culture is. Mm. You know, what is the purpose of culture? You know, mm. <laughs> and the purpose of culture, as you know, we have a thousand different definitions of it, but it's to make coherent our existence mm. and in every different way across culture across cont continents. You know, different peoples all around the world. They all have tried to make sense via culture uh, to do this. And it just seems like to me storytelling is like the fuel that keeps that going. Mm. It's actually like the fuel or the thing that just keeps it going and all sorts of ways of doing that. Uh, you know, in the ancient yeah. ways, uh, yeah. our ways, everybody's ways, writing, all the modern, you know, multimedia sort of stuff. And all yeah, That's yeah. what it seemed to me. Different ways of Different keeping ways. that culture alive. Yes, yes, yes. Stephen, did you want to say something? Um, oh, <laughs> when it comes to... A per <laughs> I mean, I guess when I write something, I don't know if I write it with the intent... I, I just write about issues, you know, that I might be going through at the time or things that are going through my head. Um, you know, for example, when the whole Andrew Bolt case thing was happening, mm -hmm. I wrote a poem um, about that and... It was more that I was writing it because of how I felt and also conversations I'd have with other Aboriginal people and um, reading, you know, Anita's book, Am I Black Enough For You? Mm. And for me, I think writing's always been kind of a form of therapy as well. I can find that if I'm, if I'm not sure about something, I'll start writing and then usually by the time I get to the end of something, I have more of a clarity about it. But it's funny how then, um, you know, when people react to it and... I find that it m can mean different things to a black audience and then to a, a white audience. Um, so how do you, how do you how do you respond to that? How do I respond to it? How do you respond to the different reactions? Um, I'm actually well, I'm actually blown away to tell you the truth because I didn't think anyone would be interested. Like when I started writing poetry, I just kind of I always thought my stuff was too simplistic and it wasn't you know flash or anything like that. But then you know I was kind of writing that it was really resonating with people and. It was the thing about how um, I think then too, it's people started using poem, my poems in cultural awareness or at mm. uni and lectures and started mm. using and that scared the shit out of me when I thought, well, I'm educating Australia. I went, oh, God, really? <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, and then kind of... So then it got used as education to educate people. Mm. But then also I found that, you know, with Aboriginal people, it was instilling a pride in them as well, which I think that really means a lot to me that if you know if my writing's inspiring my people um but if it's also educating 
white people, you know, then it has that kind of dual mm. purpose, then, you know, that's, that's just really awesome to me. Good. Mm. And so, Fred, with your experience in hip-hop, mm. and yep. you were talking to me today about the, the mechanisms of hip-hop and hip-hop being a tool to tell stories as well through music and to keep those kind of, you know, those cultural fuel fires burning. Yeah. What, is, what have been your experiences? Um, yeah, it serves as two roles. So, like, uh, for me and for a lot of Indigenous artists, we're talking about in hi Indigenous hip-hop artists, like, I can't talk for all of them. Uh, no, but um, e for everybody, but... She'll um, get you up the back later, yeah, though, yeah, if yeah. you're <laughs> saying anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. um, so, I'll, um, uh, I think, for me, it serves two purposes. So, like, um, one is for my community, but... Uh, in another sense, it's storytelling. It's what we've always done. We've just always been storytellers, so we're telling stories. And for me, what's um, we what's weird being an Indigenous hip hop artist, um, or being labelled an Indigenous hip hop hip hop artist, that I've noticed over the years is that um, before before you know before a certain time, I was just a hip hop artist, and then I became the Indigenous hip hop artist. So now I'm a voice for Indigenous people. The story never changed the whole time, but it suddenly went from, oh, okay, you're, now you're Indigenous hip-hop artists. And I noticed within the... We're writing f not for our own community, as, we're, as well as writing for our own community, we're writing for the wider community. So the messages in the in 90% of the Indigenous hip-hop albums that you can pick up, are, you know, 90 to 95, 99% of them, is a message for the broader community mm. and our own community. Mm. It's a snapshot into our lives. But... In terms of hip hop, you've got the Australian music industry, then you've got what, Aussie hip hop, and then you've got Indigenous hip hop. And I don't think we're too far different from mainstream hip hop, as in we talk about stuff that's happening in our communities or whatever. And, you know, there's a lot of conscious music out there as well. But it seems that as soon as it gets that label on it, people in the in the wide, like in the wider scene, go ah oh, well that they're making indigenous hip hop that's for black fellows, so I won't bother listening to it. It's interesting. So we, you know, mm. and it's like mm. you <coughs> you play, or you, you play. I noticed like for years been going up and down the east coast, and you play to the same crowds. Like there's like-minded people. There's people that will listen to it, <coughs> and they'll come and they'll bring their friends, and it'll be um, you know alternative sort of uni students, and then the black fellows. And then, um, and then some older, you know, some older people have been surprised. Like Woodford, when you get up to Woodford Folk Festival, I never listened to that rap crap. But what you guys, when I actually sat there at the back and heard what you were talking <laughs> about, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so I think, the message um, behind the yeah, yeah, the there's lyrics. a message. Yeah, so it serves a few. Purposes and I think, I um, and I think this question for you, Tibian, is that that experience in the hip hop industry is kind of similar to the experience in theatre and black theatre in Australia, and the evolution of black theatre in Australia having such a prominent kind of platform, it's kind of gone through ebbs and flows. And, um, you know, the first theatrical performance I ever saw was um, The Dreamers by Uncle Jack Davis performed here down in Meribah Street. And it was the first time I'd, one, read a black script written by a black fella, produced by a black theatre company with a whole cast of black actors. And that was back in the 90s, um, so it was a long time ago, um, but, but now to see young, and, you know, young black actors taking the stage, um, re keep keeping these stories alive and keeping these, these um, histories alive. And Tibian, just from your experience showing down in Sydney, with Sydney Theatre Company with Black Diggers, what did you get a sense from the audience about that story? Oh, uh, yeah. Um yeah, no, the, the audience down there was really, it was really intense. Like, it was really, a really good audience as well. We've got, most of our shows, we've got, um, we nearly got a full house. And yeah, like, the response, like, when I'm not speaking, I'm, or if I'm on stage and I'm not speaking, I'm looking out into the audience and I'm looking at the reaction, the reactions of, of all the, the audience members. And, um, the, like, the, the really, they're really into it. Like, the, the non-Indigenous and, and the, the indigenous as well, like their reactions are really, it's like, I don't know, like I've never thought like those, 
because like it's just the little it's like a littlest things on stage that we do but it's it comes out really big to them mm. so yeah no it's i guess it's different seeing watching it and being on stage as well mm. the reactions of w what kind of stuff we send through the through the play yeah that makes sense yeah and so if 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 these are our different forms of storytelling do you do you think it they still serve a purpose today in 2014 um yeah i do i i mean i Be for, devil's advocate. for example well only because like i was thinking about while i was working on this tv show we have six core actors and um when I thought about it, the six core actors in our one TV show, that's who, who are lead roles. That's more lead roles than you've actually seen on mainstream television in my 38 years of my life. I can think of Kylie Bell in um, The Flying Doctors, Aaron Patterson in Water Rats, mm. Deb Malman um, in Offspring and in Secret Life of Us, mm. Miranda Tapsell now in um, Love Child. Love Child. No. And, and, well, Annie Dingo was a host of a TV show. So that's five Indigenous people in 38 years of my life. So that's what I think with that form of storytelling through theatre. I think theatre's getting better um, in terms of... Because there's still that colour casting thing that kind of comes with theatre, but also more with TV. So I, th I think it's relevant in the sense that if we expose more about who we are as people which is, it's kind of sad that we have to expose ourselves rather than people coming in and wanting to find out who we are, mm. you know, but I, but I think it's relevant. Mm -hmm. So if, um, I'm going to ask a question, I'm going to ask a question to Annie Mary, Mary Graham, and I'm going to ask Fred to set up your guitar while I ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> Thought he got away with it, yeah. even though we're running. It's only two calls. Yeah, no, set it's it up. Right. Do you want to set it up? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> set it up, You're brother. Set it up, brother. <laughs> Did I say you set it up? So, Aunty Mary Graham, um, in in to, in 2014, do mm. you think, and and you know, beyond, and the the animation at the at the beginning kind of flagged that whole thing about, um, mm. you know, our future ancestors. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. What it, what is what it, what are we mm. going to leave? in the future for our young ones to learn and to share. Are there stories we just shouldn't be telling? Oh, geez. Uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to answer that um, yeah. because you, you can't sort of see the future, I suppose. Mm. And it's amazing what actually gets to be told, you know, 500 yeah. years ago or th 500 years in the future or th yeah. a thousand years, you know what I mean? Um, yeah it mightn't have worked out at all the way you we're thinking we're of thinking now of mm. uh, because there's so many other things, not just foundational stories, lives of um, people, mm. do you know, what, what was there before. Yep. Um, um, because it's all sort of mixed up now around the world, mm. you know. Mm. Um, so it's really... But I, I think there's a kind of... Um, what do you call it? Like a connectivity, a con connection yep. between things that happened a, a long time ago both in our sense, you know, the, those old stories, the yep. old stories, um, but also um, uh, a different way of expressing them um, all through the time and, mm. and time to come to, you know. Yep. I, I was thinking of this in... Um, um, I was reading... Because um, when I was younger, I was wanting to find out more and more about who are these fellows who came to this country and took over our place, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and why they did it, yeah, why yeah. they did it. And not necessarily only in the sense of colon colonisation, but, yeah. but in the sense of uh, history, mm. um, as in um, uh, a, br a broader thing. Um, like, um, uh, to me, col colonisation always comes out of imperialism, actually. Mm. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a colonisation if you didn't have em empires. You know, you wouldn't have empire, so you wouldn't have colon colonialism, you wouldn't have racism, actually. Mm. And that is the actual, you, you can actually spot that uh, in history. Yeah. You ever read, um, oh, what's his name, a uh, um, Roman historian, um, the guy who wrote um, 12 Caesars, anyway. Um, he was writing about the good, the so-called good ones, <laughs> you know, the good Caesars, famous ones, um, <laughs> C um, Julius Caesar, Augustus. 
the bad ones, you know, Caligula, the mad ones and all that. <laughs> but he was also talking <laughs> about <laughs> these in-between Caesars, yeah. who it just happened to be a black Caesar, actually. But mm. nobody ever knows this, that at the time he was, a, he was an actual black Caesar. That's what they called him in history, you know. And it always made me um, uh, amazed that um, uh, this, this, this particular black Caesar was uh, just simply a, uh, one of the warlord Caesars coming in, knock off the Praetorian Guard, take over, and there's Caesar for a year, you know, or six months or something, and then another one comes in, takes over, see? So this guy wasn't a good guy or anything. He was just a, you know, warlord type. Um, but the historian himself, Tacitus, I think his name was, um, no, Suturnius, uh, it wasn't any big deal that he was a black Caesar. That was what was so very interesting. At the end, he just happened to mention that he was a black Caesar. You know, he was from somewhere in North Africa. Mm, he just was. So he just was. It mm. was just. A, in fact, it was just a cutthroat warlord, just like any other. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't That's really interesting. So they didn't have a you know equal opportunity or anything yeah. like that uh, <laughs> in those days. It was maybe just they did. It wasn't pure an identified cruel position. No, <laughs> it wasn't. <a> <laughs> 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 and I, and I, thought, I, I thought, I know this is getting a bit sort of, um, not strange, but uh, odd, I suppose, in a way, but um, look at that situation then and look at this situation now. Here is a black Caesar <laughs> in charge of the world <laughs> and they're going down, the yeah. going down and down. And over See, he was there at the overseeing the fall of the Roman Empire, basically. Wow. One of those many Caesars was seeing that. And I thought, isn't it interesting how history repeats, even in ways you don't know about, well, not, not, not as well known, but when you really look at it, yeah. you know it's repeating right now. I uh, wonder if Black Caesar yeah. back then was as good looking as Black Caesar. Yeah, now. say, yes, 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 yeah. No, they had their Ooh. medals and all this sort of True. stuff of him. He know, was yeah. black, of course he was. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think but it's that interesting. I thought that was interesting, yeah. you know, um, and the things that never change really, eh? And, you know, and, and I, what's <laughs> when I when I... When I finished up high school and I came down to Brisbane for university, and that was in 1991 I came down here, and that, when I went to uni, that was the first time I ever picked up a book by a black writer, which was The Dreamers, and it was good that I got to see it a few years <laughs> later. But that was the first time, so I was 17, and I'd never read a book or a play by a black fella. And even today, and that's only, what, 20-odd years ago. Mm. So the change in um, being able to go to a bookshop now and there's actually a section on Indigenous writing mm. and written by Indigenous people mm. about Indigenous people for the wider community yeah. is a, a cultural shift that my mum said that she would never... My mum was raised on the Bible. Mm. So she was never, you know, um, never got to read anything or to yeah. see anything. Used to hear music, but mainly the music she would hear would be Charlie Pride. So, Charlie And Pride, when yeah. Uncle Jimmy Little came on the airway, she yeah, loved that because she, she could that, yeah. connect with that. So that whole evolution in 20 years of writing mm. or creating or keeping mm. those cultural fires alive has mm. changed so rapidly. Mm. Um, in the last 10, in particular with the internet and animation and the digital, um, you know, digital projects that are kind of out there, it's another dimension that we'll talk about shortly. But I do want to flick to Fred. Yep. Who's yes. going make to me sing a song, man. <laughs> I didn't make you yeah, do you anything, did. Fred. <laughs> I just so warned you that yeah, if you didn't do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just quickly tune it, and I yeah, it's weird. I'm playing it up. So oh, no, oh it's tuning it. with an iPhone. Yeah. See, yeah. back in the old days, Fred, <laughs> <laughs> you could just do it. Yeah. And wow. no one's ever got a left-handed guitar, so I had to figure out how to. Strum on a right hand guitar. You are too. Black Caesar, Black Elvis. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, Elvis like was black. No, I shouldn't he say that because um, Dan Sultan is Black Elvis and he'll, he'll oh, get yeah. in there. Um, That's another beautiful black man. Oh, this is being recorded. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to say, Anybody know what? Every adult dog growl. Gee, sorry. Ah, yes. That doesn't come on your app? No. See, technology doesn't do everything. Sorry. <gasps> Easter, Easter bunnies, bunnies get, get drunk, drunk at Easter. Easter. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, so this song, I... Um, I have to remember that. I was going to... Yeah. There's... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to... Yeah, 
Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I was going to do a song about. Um, sorry, I was going to do a song about. I don't really. I rap, so I don't really play guitar. But I've been <laughs> learning ukulele, so I can learn guitar, and it's been about two years uh, with my my little two three chord jams on this thing, thinking I'm deadly. <laughs> yeah. When you know no one can hear. But I, yeah, so this song is. Um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, so this is about, so yeah, this is just about when I was growing up, I, yeah, a lot of my mates got into drugs and um, crime, and this was just about, I just got, got, uh, constantly, you know, going to a funeral or um, hearing about another mate went to jail or seeing people walking around off their guts, heroin, speed. And I, it just, you know, sometimes when, and you, some of you might know, but sometimes things just eat away at you. It's just like, oh, I've got to get this, I've got to do something about this. And uh, I've written raps similar to this, but then I, I just wrote this, there's only two chords. And um, yeah, it's just, just a song, just to my mates, just to say, you know, like, uh, it's called Bright Star and they don't realise you know, just what they, what they have. Like one, I won't say how I know this person's, um, someone anyway, and was real, really good football player when he was younger. Maddest football player, carve up every anybody, and then got into drugs, and mm. that was it. You know, did a two year stretch, and then went back in for ten, and then got out, and then went back in for another couple of years, and he's out now, and he's on heroin, and just. Just watching, and that was like all different. We grew, I grew up with heaps of different cultures, and it, you know, um, be, living in low socioeconomic areas, uh, <coughs> I suppose being poor or having a dysfunctional family, they can't, um, you know, look after money properly, so the kids can have something. It doesn't discriminate. It's across the board. It's anywhere. It's any. You know, you can find that in any suburb in. in in town, so this is just a bit of, yeah, something about that. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and my guitar playing is really dodgy too, so just um, <coughs> just play to be the it. yeah five minutes that you Shut wish up. you, Shut up, you could get back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Playing, right. yeah. <laughs> just take a moment. Yep. Ah, <laughs> lucky there's no camera. <laughs> nah, right. It's so natural. Radio National. <laughs> hey, there's a job for me there somewhere. <laughs> no. Pot of gold at the end of the rainbow Your luck just never runs out Pushing to the limit, never living life slow. Bright star, you'll never burn out. Popping this, shoot up that, sniff it up slow. That's how you're living, I don't know you now. Mm -hmm. And I'm tired of feeling this pain. Aren't you tired of living that way? I've been crying out your name And it's driving me insane Look straight through me when I saw you lost Oh, it's killing me but I can't tell you how Sooner or later, man, something gotta give and it's gonna be you, no, it won't be me. When I look into the mirror, see the self, does it even scare you? Because it does scare me. Mm -hmm. And I'm tired of feeling this pain. 
too tired of living that way I've been crying out your name mm, And it's driving me insane Well, well, well Not pretending like I know where you're at But I'll do anything I can just to get you back I'm just saying cause I love you bros And while you're dying, I'm dying Do you understand me? No judge and jury Just a brother trying to get across to you What you mean to me Everything And I'm tired of feeling this pain Aren't you tired of living that way? I've been crying out your name mm -hmm. And it's driving me insane yeah. Yeah, A bit rusty, I know Yeah, hey, uh, I was worried about missing the voice But that was worth it, brother <laughs> 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 You're on our team. You're on thank our you, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> if my chair was backwards, I would have turned around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, one thing before we just keep on. Um, at 7.50, there's an announcement that will tell us all to leave the building and the library will be closing at 8 o'clock. So, it's not a question directed at you. So there'll be a voiceover <laughs> that'll say, the State Library of Queensland will be closing, so just be aware. Oh, that's we're talking. Yeah. Okay. Oh. okay. And if anyone's concerned. Oh, yeah. They won't shut the lights at 8 o'clock, we'll be right. We can <laughs> take a little bit of not, time. Not like a sabotage. Or no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so with the next part of the conversation, um, and I'm just cautious of time because we did start a little bit late and I do want to open up the floor to <coughs> questions. I just wanted to ask the panel, do you think the, um, do you think with so many different platforms out there, so many means and ways of sharing our culture through storytelling, whether it be theatre, hip-hop, through academia, through publication, through poetry, through television, film, dance, song, mm. um, and now with technology and the invent of the internet um, and where our stories used to be shared within community and now open up to the community of the world, do you think there is a risk of our stories and our traditions and our stories becoming diluted and um, not as valuable as they are today? Do you mean cultural mm. stories or...? And yeah, so... Mm. Yeah, well, because well, Cirque du Soleil totem popped to mind. Mm. <laughs> Has anyone seen that? Yeah, I cringed when I saw that totem. What? Have you seen that Cirque du Soleil thing? I don't know, I just cringed. ABC so, don't Cirque du Oh, am I allowed to say that on ABC? Oh, they can edit it out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I kind of cringe with that. But so Cirque du, Cirque, Cirque du Soleil's new song, a song, new show is called Totem. And it's basically, oh. it tells the evolution of man through Cirque du Soleil's style of circus mm. and, and storytelling yes, and, yes. and music and song yeah, and yeah. dance. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the hero image is of a Indian um, dancer, traditional dancer, um, mm. Canadian Indian, Indian oh, yeah. hoop dancer. Mm. Um, and um, he is a traditional dancer. He is actually a traditional dancer that is part of the show. But the, the creation of the work seems to be um, created by non-Indigenous people. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a case, it's, it, it looks beautiful and a lot of the costuming <laughs> has been done to reflect different Indigenous cultures from around the world um, who, you know, the story is about, um, the whole show is about how Indigenous cultures have this totemic system of belief and it comes yeah. back to how they tell their stories but it has been created by non-Indigenous people. Which is a really interesting. Mm, it might take. be, yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I just saw the ad, so it might be, you know, very good. But yeah, I kind of just cringed. But um, 
and I, it's kind of in regards to that. <laughs> and I was thinking about this when we talk about storytelling. You know, it's funny how it always seems to be just with writing, and writing doesn't equate storytelling, I don't think. Mm. You know, because we've had it through dance, we've had it through song. Um, and the internet, yeah, is it friend or foe? I, th I don't know, I think, I think it's good in the sense, like, with the um, writing Black, the online anthology that's going to be coming out um, soon, is the thing I've loved about this is that with um, the publication, they've actually got videos of us performing it as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good in the sense that it's actually been used that I'm able to get across the way I've wanted that to be told. Mm -hmm and it kind of doesn't leave room open for interpretation. Mm. But sometimes I think, yeah, words kind of, what you look at on the page can be left open for interpretation. Mm. So whether that's just the internet, but, you know, that's books and anything as mm. well. Yeah, so, mm. yeah, does it dilute it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know. Mm. And I know a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, <laughs> I think it's that, it's that um, I was talking to my mother about Totem. And she said, well, Nadine, if it's a good thing that the culture is getting out there, then isn't that a good thing? Isn't it a good thing that, um, you know, thousands of people go and see a show and it teaches them something about another culture that they may not be aware of? Mm. And while I think it is, I think if it's done appropriately and it's done respectfully from that voice of that culture, then that's when I think it is, mm. it's valid. And I think now with having so many different platforms to tell our stories, our stories are now being told by us. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a big cultural shift for Australia, I think, mm. Mm. is mm. that it, sometimes those voices may be hard to hear and to listen to and they might hurt you and they might challenge you, but it's coming from a place of respect and knowing as an Indigenous person. And I think that's where I look at the four people that are sitting on this panel are the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of storytellers and cultural mm. sharers in our community. And now having those platforms to share those stories mm. um, is, is, is a great thing if it's done the right way. Mm. So I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that, Ani I, Mary? I was yeah. going to say the same thing. Yeah. That I'd, it's a very hard thing to answer, actually, really. Mm. Hey, um, because also um, authentic, you know, authenticity is... Yep. It's a changing thing too. I mean, even in um, you know old um, foundational stories, yeah. um, the old you know dreaming stories, because uh, as I understand it, the dreaming stories had to actually change because the land itself changed. You know, uh, earthquakes went off, um, volcanoes. So, so another dreaming story. You know mm. what I mean? And another one, and another one as rivers change their course, just yeah. over long periods of time, of course. So. So nothing stays kind of as the story changes. Uh, and nothing stays the same exactly because nothing ever in life itself, in existence, doesn't stay stay the same. But but in all of those different er um, areas, what you were saying before, multimedia and um, you know, and the computer and um, uh, all sorts of creative sort of ways, the only, um, in a sense, uh, the, the most obvious to me, the fly in the ointment, <laughs> as so to speak, of the whole thing of storytelling is, um, again, I'm kind of coming back to the thing of um, imperialism or, you know, yep. colonialism and so on, is, is when um, propaganda started to come in. Because propaganda is a story too, do you know what I mean? Mm. Depending on who's telling it, eh? Yeah. And because it's such a powerful thing, it's got the media on side. Do you, yep. know, do you know what I mean? The media is, especially mm. in this country, it's such a third-rate bloody media, do you know? <laughs> third-rate, that's the worst that I can uh, say yeah, about yeah. it. You know, <laughs> there. Oh, not the, you know. Except for ABC. <laughs> yeah. I should have, I forgot, I forgot. <laughs> ABC's deadly. No. Yes. ABC's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's, yeah. uh, so yeah. wh what does it, what does that mean? Do you know what I mean? Our, our own, sometimes our own stories, our own, yeah. um, uh, I mean, the truth about things, big things like the intervention and stuff, they, they roll out this propaganda every now and then mm. that it's our fault. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's all our fault. Mm. Um, and there's no truth uh, backing it up. Even all the research is dodgy. It's been proved that the, all the research is dodgy. But mm. the story keeps getting peddled all the time. So that's a story in itself. But yeah. it's in the controlled hands, controlled. you know, of, yep. of other people who have power over us. Political power, that yeah. is. Um, so, I mean, just in a purely creative way, there's all kinds of outlets and ways yeah. and systems of, of doing, you know, doing, doing this. Um, but... 
I don't know, how do, you, how do you keep this authenticity? You know, is it pure feeling or is it um, the truth? Because the truth is kind of, <laughs> can be kind of changed too, depending yeah. on, you know, who's, who's saying it. it, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, yeah. I remember getting in a bit of a, bit of a sort of a feisty, um, <laughs> Uh, robust argument about uh, the, the whole history of the na native police. Do you know what I mean? Uh, how did that happen? Do you know who, do, who, you know, where did it, how did it start? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and so on. Um, and again, going back to colonialism, you know, the deliberate, um, separ what do you call it? Divide and rule. You know, dividing and ruling. Divide that and divide, divide and conquer. conquer. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that sort of thing happening here as mm. it did all over the world. So, I don't know. Big question mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I In think, the end. I think um, Ujuru <laughs> New Knuckles, one of her quotes outside hmm. was that the artist will create and the audience will respond to, taunt, respond to it and hmm. how they've been educated to and the politician will react. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right, yeah. yes. Those weren't exactly her words. Yes, I forgot yes. a little yeah, bit yeah, of yeah. them. <laughs> but yes. it was to that nature and I think that's really yes, important. Yes. And Tibby, and a, a question yes. for you yes. is that as our, as a part of our... Um, future ancients, our ancestors in training, what are the stories that you want to hear or to be a part of and to tell? <coughs> um, I guess, yeah, no, um, I had a thought about that question too. Um, yeah, I've, there's a lot actually. For me there is a lot, but um, I guess the main one was just um, trying to get, trying to educate really, uh, educate and also, um, also, guide the next the younger generation after me as well mm. is what I really want to try and put out there is like um, trying to keep it positive in the community in their communities and and in their families and every all their everyday life as well and yeah. growing up and making the right decisions yeah. so I guess um trying to be a yeah like trying to just set good good um and I get be a good role model and mm. trying to yeah like just put good positive stuff on, on stage and yeah. yeah. Good. I'm going to throw out a question to the audience. Oh, I'm not going to throw out. <laughs> Has anyone from the audience got a question for the panel? Yeah. Oh, who's got the microphone? <laughs> this is Eleanor. Yeah. <laughs> 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 She's a Can I buy a vowel? Go, oh, this isn't, no, oh no, wrong show, no, good. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel and I'm just wondering, with talk about getting your stories out there and with talk about um, keeping your, keeping our stories like as future ancients, um, I just had a, a question but I'll explain why. My question um, comes about because in some things that I've been studying, I've been learning about the spread of technology, apps, iPads, iPhones in developing nations in um, like uh, various areas, especially in, in Africa and some countries there where it's um, working, seems to be working well and other countries it seems to be not working well. And one of the things that comes up is the fact that a lot of the apps, you know, we're talking about voices perhaps being heard or lost, um, are developed by um, West people who are from dominant Western cultures, you know, predominantly... Um, you know, white backgrounds or from the United States, nothing against where they're from, mm. but there's the risk of, and one of the issues that's been brought up is that the um, people who are using the apps in the developing nations um, have limits to the, to the technology, the apps are developed by other people, and it's not there so much, their voices and their stories that are getting out. So my question is, mm. how do you, in this age of technology, get your stories out through those mediums? Authentically and appropriately. YouTube. Uh, I might. <laughs> might nah. <laughs> well, I think I like I've done I've done some poetry and I've actually put them up on YouTube and that's been the good thing I guess where people have used those and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I guess you know with the technology and that there that's good in the sense that um, I'm able to do something you know in my um, lounge room at home and then you know someone can use it somewhere and it, it's also and it's being said in the way that I want to say it as well so mm -hmm. um, and I think control, there's a yeah. um, down in Redfern yeah. the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence has a whole strategy committed to um, uh, Indigenous digital excellence and a part of that is working with um, Indigenous communities to create 
those apps and to create um, programs that com are for community, from a community perspective. And um, we went to a, a, a session, a two-day workshop about it, and they were even thinking about the creation of something like, um, you know how you have Google? But actually having it called Doris? <laughs> because Doris. blackfellas yeah. like to Doris, and that's what oh Google is, it's one big yes. Doris. So you want to... Oh, you want to... It was called Doris, eh? Hey? Yeah, so it was... It was those kind of platforms that, um, with the, with those um, those platforms being taught now to our communities, I think mm. probably in you know maybe ten or y maybe ten even less than ten years time, we'll see more of those apps being created by community and used by community for community. Yugen Bear Museum has a language app that is available. That's a free language app that's totally mm. been created by Yugen Bear in consultation with community. Mm. There's also another platform called Matuku, which is a, um, an online smart device friendly museum, basically, oh. and community can have the ownership over it. It's kind of the same to picture culture, but it's a different kind of platform. Um, NCIE are doing a lot of work with young people because mm. they're going to be you know, our future ancients, our, you know, our ancestors mm. in training, mm. um, and even have a kind of like a, a black version of Facebook, mm. just primarily for them. So, um, I mean, I get real funny with technology. It's just because I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to press the shift button here. I, yeah. But I think it's a, I, I think, you know, with the... We've seen the changes with um, MySpace and then um, Facebook, and mm. it, it's a, it's a it's a concern that's kind of is it is out there in a lot of Australian communities. And there's the work that's been done at the library that are going out to communities, Aboriginal communities in Queensland, that are trying to address that as well, because we don't even have broadband in some of those communities. Mm. Uh, Sorry, Fred. <coughs> I was just thinking maybe to um <coughs> uh, maybe it's about um you know, people outside, because the, the, the people who are making the technology might not necessarily even be bothered thinking about that. So if people are bringing it to their attention, um, you know, surely they'd have to incorporate a way for those communities to gain some power in, uh, in controlling that technology and learning about it and, and um, you know, uh, taking, the ra taking the rain, so to speak, over a few you know, in a, in a few years, in a, in, a, in a couple of generations, who knows, you know, mm. just depends on how, how well they become developed, if they can become yeah. developed, if they have the ability to even, you know, if we're talking about little villages where there's, they're skint and they've got nothing, the mm. likelihood of it happening in real, you know, realistically is but I, very I slim. There was a project that was being done on the Torres Straits that was using mobile phone um, texting. So you know how there's texting language, texting language, I don't even know what that's a term, no. like LMAO and LOL and them other ones. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so there was, th they were, it was the project to look at texting, the language of texting, the language in the Torres Strait and Creole. So the young people that were involved with this project developed a project around those three languages. So even that was about maybe five, six years ago, seven years ago. So even then they were starting to look at how do we use this smart device, this new technology as a means and a way of keeping a culture alive but also merging a culture and a language together, which is mad. Well, uh, you know, and it's, I think it's a tough one though too because if you're talking about apps and stuff like that, I mean, if you look at some communities, you know, issues they have in schooling, um, you know, it's like when, when I was travelling around remote communities and we would talk with um, a lot of the people from the schools and they would talk about how these teachers would come in who were straight out of university, um, but they, they went remote because they had to get their points up. I'm not sure how the system worked or something to then be able to teach in a metropolitan area. And so they'd come straight out of uni, go to these um, communities, try to teach them in what they've learnt in university and what that just doesn't apply to these communities. Mm. And so by the time they finally work out how to work with the kids, and communicate with them, the points are up and then they fly back oh. to the city and then it's a vicious cycle all over again. And there's also the, you know, there's kind of a change happening now, but even with communities where, you know, they're teaching kids in English and English is the second, third, 
fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh language. You wouldn't teach, you know, um, you know, Chinese kids with who speak Chinese. You wouldn't try to teach them in English. So, and this is happening in communities mm. here in Australia where they're trying to teach kids English who that just isn't the language. Mm. So, you know, in terms, I think, if even when it comes to te technology, we're just talking about books, like school, primary school books, children books that need to be written in language for these kids. So, you know, when you think about technology and apps and that, it's, yeah, that's definitely a long way to, way to go in that it sense as well. Way. And, you know. There's slow, there's slow movements happening out yeah. there. But then priorities are different in communities all the time as well. And even in urban, yeah. my, you know, it's State of Origin tomorrow night. Who cares about the budget? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> are there any other questions? Is there another question? Yep, Sue. Hello to the, the panel. I'm enjoying the talk. Um, Fred, you'd spoken earlier about advice that your mother had given uh, when going to another country. And I think often uh, in working uh, with writing, um, which I do in publishing um, with in indigenous stories, that um, that, that um, authority of the source is something that h has been lost. Uh, with Western society, which is something that can be um, learned or, um, you know, valued. Uh, can you t explain why your mother said this and why you feel that it's uh, an important um, advice that you continue to use yourself? Uh, looking at it from today's perspective of, you know, there was no Facebook. Back then. She could have told me on Facebook. <laughs> there was no Facebook back then, but I don't think it's something that she would have told me on Facebook. <coughs> this mm. is something personal, this is something <coughs> spiritual, something that has been handed down from generation to generation. It's not something that you just take lightly. And um, I think for me, it's important to just pass it on. And I, d I know, I, know I, d I, um, I already talk to my kids about it all the time when we go go to someone else's a beach somewhere or something and they want to go take something. I say, oh, no, you don't take this. It's not mm. your country. So um, <coughs> for me, I, th I think, th um, I don't know what to think. In, in it's instinctual. So I, I, I've ne I never get asked these questions about it. For me, it's just natural. I just think, oh, okay, yep. Well, I, I know I've heard all these things now growing up. I take them and I give them to my kids. And that's all. And, that, and then I, all I can hope is that they... I, they grow up to be, well, eventually I turned out all right, but, <laughs> to, you know, that they, they, that they grow, up, grow up to be all right and then they pass those messages on to their kids um, and giving them the values of, you know, they don't have an Xbox. Their Xbox is a five store, five thing. They've got a big white bookshelf each with books, mm. Blackfellas books, Yep. Kids' stories, Aboriginal stories, and then stories from all around the world, you know. And they, that's their, I think all I can do is build the foundations for them to want to find out and want to be, or inspire them to want to take hold of this information that I know I have, that I know my mum has, that her father gave her, and her mother gave her, and p was passed down. Sort of like when we were talking about just a it's a bit off track, but if I may, we were talking about something there earlier about um, stories getting lost, um, and I'm, you know, Henry Reynolds' book, um, Forgotten War. Mm. A lot of those stories in there, I know, I've heard them, and a lot of Murrays know those stories. Mm. We know it because we know, oh yeah, Cal Cadoon mob got marched off a cliff. Blah blah blah. Remember, oh, old Nan told me this and that and this and that, and everybody knows. We all know that for. We just take it for granted that we know it. But, and then I was sitting here reading the book and Henry Reynolds is talking about how, you know, a lot of um, his peers don't buy into it, that okay. there was a, a frontier war and that this war, you know, raged on for 150 years or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's just bizarre to me, like what we were talking about, it, it, that, like that story that my mum told me that was instinctual that, it's just uh, inst inst it was um, 
it's an it's a natural instinct for me to take it and pass it on. Same with those stories. Yeah. And my, and my kids will hear about that when I think they're ready to hear about it. But then to see that it's denied by a lot of you know like a, from a lot of people and uh, when uh, Henry Reynolds is talking about it, he's going okay well this 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 and he points out a lot of facts about a lot of the stuff li literature you know papers that were published and. Um, letters that were sent and stuff like that, and people people had written to pa newspapers of that, and I think it was right there. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody saw it, knew it was happening, but you know, I don't know. It, to and me, it's a and it's important. Then, as Annie Mary was saying, right back at the beginning, is that you know to stoke those cultural fires, we mm. have to keep telling those stories yeah, through whatever mechanism, whatever platform. Yep. That we need to tell them. Yeah. Well, it's funny though, like when you're talking about it, it's a friend of mine, a, you know, um, a white girl from Townsville. And it was funny how we'd have discussions all the time and I would talk about stuff and because she'd never saw it to her, it kind of wasn't real. And it's funny how when she watched, you know, the telly movie Marbo, then she believed it, which <laughs> was kind of weird. And, you know, and that's what I said to her. And I said, lies. Yeah, and I, that's <laughs> the thing. And I said, you know, it's funny, it's because she was really <laughs> shocked about, you know, when they wouldn't serve him a drink in Townsville you know, in the bar, when he went in the bar and pub. And I'm like, yeah. I said, but see, we've, we've grown up knowing those stories all our lives. We've been told those stories, but it's not something you really see too much. You know what I mean? It's, mm. you know, and perfect thing was, you know, which really annoyed me. I remember when they were having a discussion about the Aboriginal flag being on the Australian flag. And the guy said, why should the Aboriginal flag be on there? Um, they never fought for any war in this country. And that's because of what we're showing, of what a digger is, with all yeah. the images that are plastered at us. You know yeah. what I mean? And, you know, um, and where was I going with this? And so, yeah, but you, you, you'd see all these images. And so for him to say that, and I thought, well, Aboriginal people, they've been involved, like, um, from the Boer War back, you know, like, right way up, back. way back. Mm -hmm. Basically, every war this country's ever seen, Aboriginal people have been involved in. So, you know, it's all about reality is perception and what people see in the way they they take that. And we're saying that, and Aunty Mary is saying before, that storytelling maybe isn't the right word. It is about our culture and the way we share our culture and we teach our culture. And culture is always evolving. It's always going to change. Mm -hmm. The last 20 years have seen phenomenal changes, so who knows where we'll be as, a, as an Australia in another 20 years, another 40 years. And with all of these different platforms and all of these different means and ways of sharing, then at least those stories will constantly be told and stoked. Those fires will constantly be, yeah. be, be told and shared. I was, I was going to say, too, to do with storytelling, the language itself will change. Yes. You know, in um, Europe and Britain, um, English was different uh, five, six hundred years ago. So can you imagine 500 years from now in this country, let alone a thousand years, and, maybe and we're in this neighbourhood, yeah. do you know what I mean? And I do believe um, it's going to be a, a Chinese century, probably going to be a Chinese millennium, actually. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm not saying we're all going to speak Chinese, but it'll, it's going to be an amalgamation of languages. So, yeah. so that always has an impact on stories too, itself, yeah. just language itself, you know? Mm. So maybe when Tibian's kids grow up... Mm. They'll be able to sing the national anthem in an Aboriginal language when they go to school. Or a new one. And we have we'll have one more question, if that's... What, or two. Oh, three. Okay. We'll go over to this gentleman here. Sorry, I'm pointing. <laughs> so we might finish with these three questions and might kind of keep it tight and then Tibian's going to take us out for the night. I mean, not take... Take us out. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> Holy... Tuesday night. Hi. Um, thanks. It's Harry from the Blue Mountains. Um, just a comment and a question, really. I really appreciate this evening and the fact that you've posed the question like you have and the fact that you've got uh, more experienced some senior members and, and the young, young side. I think that's really important that you got that and fa fantastic performance for it. That was really good. Thank you for that. Uh, look, I think it's, you know, it's such an important thing. If stories, storytelling is such a, stories are just a healing aspect. And I think as a white fella that we've got a lot to learn from, from your personal, your cultural and your human stories because they, you know, you, you spoke before, you speak from the heart. It's something that as a white fella, we have more trouble with doing. 
having that connection with speaking authentically and speaking mm. openly and honestly, it often comes harder for us. So I think we've got a lot to learn, and I think it's important the evolution of storytelling for us to em evolve as humans, human stories, mm. to move from the personal through the cultural ones and get to the human stories. And I'm thinking in particular, I saw sort of um, King Lear, is, a, is an Aboriginal performance at King Lear mm. made last year in Sydney. It was a fantastic human story, all set in the Aboriginal outback and mm. all Aboriginal mm. actors. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've got a lot to learn that. from whatever media you use, whichever oh. way you portray your stories and how you how you how they evolve and come through. Yeah. I didn't know what to expect from tonight. I guess I kind of hoped that it would be a story. So I'd, I'd, li I'd love it if there was a 30 second story one of you from the panel could share with us well before actually we finish, yeah. uh, <laughs> you're not shy now Fredo. <laughs> <laughs> well guys Stephen and Tibian will be our storytellers to finish thank you shock thank you did up the back oh Hi, my name's Leah. Um, I've really enjoyed tonight as well. I just had a question with regards to um, curriculum in schools, basically, and a syllabus that was developed called Shared History. Is there going to be more of that? Because I think that we need it. Because when we talk about our nurses and our teachers going into the Indigenous communities, they don't even know what to expect because they're not taught it when they mm. should be taught it. And this is primary school, um, preschool, primary school, high school. So I just wanted to know if there was any more work towards that. Where I do don't know. I oh. wish, I hope so. When I was doing arts council and we were touring schools, it was funny that we weren't only educating the kids, but we were educating the teachers as well. And, mm. you know, the teachers were shocked that, you know, when we explained to them that we all had different language groups and we were like, Europe, we had, you know, like Fred was saying, we've like got our yeah. own countries and where we're yeah. from, you know, so hopefully, and honestly, like we had kids ask us what country we were from. And that, that he um, was chocolate and I was vanilla chocolate. Vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like, and it was, On and latte. there was one school, I think, and that was to Wong, <laughs> to Wong school who actually had any understanding. And that's mm. because they did Aboriginal studies and the kids had a really informed discussion with us afterwards, mm. but yeah, I hope, I hope so. It would be great to think that the curriculum stays there um, and that it doesn't just come down to the responsibility of the school and the principal, that it's oh God, no. it's yeah. compulsory. It's compulsory. Yeah. It should and be compulsory. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, there's... I, I was the first um, member of my family to go to university. So mm. there are, you know, there are more of our kids that are going through. It mm. might not, not be tertiary it might be different you know academies mm. and different training and and you know as, as we get more teachers too that are you know trained up and they might be able to influence the curriculum and the changes in that as well it'd be mm. great to see mm. you know there's there's different spots and gems around the countryside mm. that are leading the way mm. um but even mm. when i was in grade seven i remember looking mm. at a book about the history of aboriginal people in Mackay, which is where i'm from which is my mother's country and i opened up and it had a picture of the South Sea Islander community. Mm. I was like, yeah, same, Ooh. same, but different. <laughs> oh. And I remember <laughs> saying to my mum, not right. Mm, not but right. that was, you know, that was the 80s. So there's, you know, there have been changes. I think there's a long way to go. Fred, long you do some work go. in schools yeah. and stuff too. Yeah, and I know there's a document uh, embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives, mm. but that oh. hasn't been... Uh, fully, I don't, I don't think it's embedded. embedded. It's no. not embedded into the <laughs> curriculum, yeah. <laughs> but it's a great document. <laughs> and uh, mm. I think, and just looking through the ACARA stuff, you know, mm. on this, I don't know what ACARA stands for, but all the teachers have to go on there and look at the, oh, yeah, the I curriculum, Australian that, curriculum, yeah. something, something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then, uh, yes, so uh, when I looked at what was, you know, on offer for mm. children in say prep to three, I was amazed, I was like, man, what, it's, it's like tiny little sections, just one little snapshot, and that's what kids are expected to, to learn, and that's that's what they get of Aboriginal people, till NAIDOC week, till we rock up and do some dancing, yeah. you know what I mean? And that, that's a it's really crazy. important thing too, because we've, mm. you know, had chats with Fred and that about, if it's a piece of paper that has to be enforced, sometimes it's, 
less likely to be taken up. Mm. Um, and so what we had teachers come in here quite often. So we kind of say to them, if you go and make your own connections in your community, that's when that learning process will start for you. Mm. So one, get to know who the local mob are. Yeah. Introduce yourself to some of the elders. Introduce yourself mm. self to some of the service providers in your area because that's where <coughs> that knowledge, that un, mm. un, unwritten knowledge and mm. history lies and that's where the valuable learning comes mm. from. And it takes a long time mm. and it takes that confidence like you were saying. It's that, mm. how do I take the first step? Mm. Mm. You, you know, it's just to do with the curriculum, uh, uh, just going sort of further back a bit to do with the um, how teachers are taught in this country. Mm. It is probably, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I get really wild with this sort of thing, that um, they should be really modernised and much more better educated teachers themselves. The whole curriculum for teaching teachers, they don't know a thing about, they're not taught anything about l understanding their own history and culture for a start. They're completely uneducated about their own their own um, background, the cultural background from coming from other cultures, of course, mainly the English, of course. They don't know anything about where ideas came from. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's probably slightly better than about 20 years ago, myself and my good friend and colleague and sister, um, Linda Watson, we mm. went and <laughs> gave talks to, um, what do you call it, the um, college, teacher's college at Kelvin Grove. You yeah. know? The ignorance was just staggering, absolutely staggering. You know, um, so they don't know, they don't know anything about Aboriginal culture. They know f all about their own culture, <laughs> and that's where they got to start. But it seems like the education departments in this country, you know, they're they're backward themselves. So they're not going to sort of try and lift the level of awareness and understanding here anyway. You know, um, so it's got to start way back, not even beyond like. Um, um, government policies about education, you know. Um, it's got to be modernised mm. for a start. They've There's just got to understand something about their own culture, uh, ideas, nothing nothing at all. Even a lo whole lot of other cultures, they, they, they do. Uh, Western cultures, I mean, like especially European. Mm. They go to high school, they learn philosophies. They learn the philosophies of their own, and you know, their ancestors, ancestors. of th those ideas, where they came from and so on. They don't do anything like that here. You know, and they could. There's stacks of them. You know, English and European. You know, they could look at all of that. Then, then they'd be a little bit on the path to understanding our, our yep. culture. Mm. Mm. You know, they'll never understand us unless they understand themselves. Yeah, mm. I was just going to say, yeah. there's a bigger agenda yeah. beyond all of us, beyond all the teachers and the education department that you know none of us have any control over. I think. Yeah. One day we will. One day. <laughs> So I have one more question, one more question, and then we might just go to the end if we like. Yeah. I thought there was a. You you, you want to go? Okay. <laughs> go on. Oh. <coughs> Tibian's just departing slightly. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be back. He's asked to leave the room. Mm. <laughs> Good evening to the panel, and thank you all for such a wonderful evening. I can sense a longing perhaps a passion, a passion, I think, too, um, about getting the history of Aboriginal people in this country well known. And what my argument is, we need to have in the National War Memorial, the frontier wars, those wars mm. that mm. so destroyed Aboriginal people. Mm. Don't tell me it should be stuck off into, into a museum somewhere. Mm. And that, I guess, for all of us, for the First Nation peoples and the non-First Nation peoples, we've got to get out there together and make a, make a passionate plea. It'll take a long time. They're not going to move things over. Sure, the, the um, uh, participation of Aboriginal people in the European wars is important and gives respect, but how about let's know more about what was done and um, how brave Aboriginal people were in that time. That's I my view. Thank yeah, you. no, I very so agree with you there. Like it's um, it's funny just like when you were saying that how people don't want to hear that it was a war and they like mm. to sugarcoat it or you know they they colonized mm. they settled they like to you know so paint yeah. a pretty picture of it mm. and you know kind of like the thing when they're going on about constitutional recognition and you know I'm funny with that in the sense that. Um, they, you know, the recommendation is that they say um, Aboriginal people 
were the original occupants of Australia. They didn't want to say owners because they found if they said owners, mm. 65, 70% people would vote against it. Mm. And so for me, that just says, well, they're not ready mm. for it. Then if they can't even say Aboriginal people were owners, then they're not ready mm. to, to do that. And, um, you know, and it's exactly the same thing with frontier wars, that people mm. need to come to terms with that as well mm. and, um, you know, move forward with that. And, and Henry Reynolds was here as part of the Clancestry program and was talking about mm. that, that book that he'd written. And um, he, um, he had said that if we are going to, um, if, if as a nation we were going to accu accurately represent the wars fought mm. by, Australian, by Australian troops, etc., is that a percentage of the 360 odd million dollars that they're commemorating towards the war, the war commemorations, a percentage of that should be should be given to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to create their own museum that do, that mm. accurately depicts the true story of the frontier wars, mm. um, because it's a phenomenal amount of money, yes, and yes. and it's a it's always mm. what strikes me about Henry Reynolds as a white fella is that he is so he is so centred in his history, his black history. Yeah. As a white Australian, he's centred in it, he knows it, and he respects it. And it's always been this thing with me in Australia and this whole kind of, you know, there is this, the Australian culture, there's the Aboriginal, Torres Strait and multicultural. The core of the Australian identity is its First Nations people. Central to mm -hmm. each and every one of us is a, is a good understanding of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history because it's a history mm. that should be shared and it's not until that mm. history is shared, accepted as, um, as Honey Mary was mm. saying before, as the Black Caesar. It was. It is a part of our history as Australians, whether we be black, white or brindle, mm. but it's getting it to that point, uh, the central ideology of the Australian psyche is mm. our mm. First Nation history. Only mm. then I reckon we can be a truly fully settled and happy country. Maybe. Yeah, I salute Henry Reynolds for his work. He's I been, he he's been my, out he's there wonderful. inspiring me all my life. I so cost yes. him at the cafe <laughs> the next day, poor fellow. But <laughs> I had to. I couldn't let him run away. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, he's very... And he, he, uh, um, Uncle Lionel Fogarty asked a really interesting question at that forum too. And he said, you know, is there a point in your studies as an academic and as a researcher and a writer mm. where you're going to hand over... Hand over to an Indigenous person to tell their story. And, and Henry was like, yep, when that time comes, absolutely, because they're no longer my stories to tell. So that even that, cha that, that cultural shift in his mind mm. as a, mm. whoop, you know, a right, smart yeah. man is, is mm. happening. Mm. Mm. One quick, one, we're going to probably get ousted in a minute. <laughs> we, might have to, we might have to wrap it up. Yeah. Is that all right? We might, well... Finish up and then we can accost these people. <laughs> <laughs> accost them. Um, so what we wanted to do is to um, finish off the night with a performance from one of our future ancients, um, Tibian. And um, in honour of our fallen soldiers um, and those who you know, went to foreign shores, both men and women, um, Tibian was going to perform something from Black Diggers. Yeah, this is um, one of my monologues that I've got in Black Diggers. So um, it's just about when they came back, they they thought, well, when they're in the war, they they all worked together as one. They all moved as one as Australians. Then they thought, by then they thought when they came back that everything would be the same as when they went to the war. They were all friends. But when they got back, it was the same. They was they was weren't treated as equals. They were... They got their money taken away from them again, and they were under the protection, under the protection board. So, um, this is one of the monologues from when they got back. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think I've been heard. I left half a lung and my youth there, and all that kept me going some days, some nights. In the frost, in the heat, shutting the eyelids of all my mates after they had breathed their last. All that kept me going sometimes was telling myself, 
you're fighting to protect your country. You're finally fighting to protect what's yours. This may have escaped your notice, sir, but this is an Aboriginal community. Our grandparents were moved here because they were in the way. And probably their parents before them, going back to the first cursed moment white men wandered into our lands. Sorry. I just went blank, sorry. <laughs> can I just do a, can I do a, a snippet of um, one of the uh, Digi Youths ones yeah, that I did? Go yeah, for um, it. it's I know, um, this monologue. Um, myself and uh, one of the other ACPA students is in the audience today. Um, we did a we did a, a a play called Glad Tomorrow. It's about um. Well, they got a whole group of boarding students got together and they told their stories about what it, feel, what it felt like to move away from their community and home and they made little monologues and it turned out to be a play. So um, this is one of the kids, um, their experience. <coughs> the thing about women is they've got to be treated with respect. Got to put up with the demands. Got to pretend you're interested in finding a suit that matches the colours of their formal dress. Got to give in when they nag and nag and nag. Because at the end of the day, we need them. We need each other. They're women. They're the mothers of life. And we, us men, well, we're the fathers. The men in my community spend our weekends hunting for food to bring back to our families. We go out, all of us, all together, and practice hunting like the old days. Dugongs are my favorite. It's better than anything you can get in the city. Back no, we make, we, make, we make spears out of tree branches. Uh, light ones from madwood trees and heavy ones from bloodwood. At the end of the weekend, we bring back some meat and the women make a big feed. Men and women are so different. But when we're all together, it makes sense. We need them and they need us. Now, when I say women, I don't mean my cranky English teacher, Miss Taylor. That woman's had it in for me ever since my black feet stepped off that plane a year ago. She doesn't think I belong here, I can tell. I don't know why she bothers with me sometimes when there's a bunch of kids more than willing to sit there and lap up her bullshit about the beauty of the English language. She thinks the English language is the be all and end all of life she does. Things are what separates the civilized from the uncivilized, the good from the bad, the proud from the shame. Well, I did some research on Miss Taylor's treasured English language. I used one of her detentions for it. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the English language was only invented in the 400s, 1,600 years ago. Aboriginal language has been spoken ever since we've been here, mm. 60,000 years. Miss Taylor's English language has one official dialect. Not too much for her to get her head around, eh? <laughs> <laughs> there are over 150 Aboriginal dialects. But some aren't doing too well, and that's what worries me. Miss Taylor's English language expresses the world how people like Miss Taylor see it. The, the earth is dry. The sky is blue. The sea is vast. But only Aboriginal language have words for how I see it. Akin Kenya and Melon Munmunen. Akin Kanea Man. Akin. Akin Ken. What will happen when Miss Taylor's treasured English language is all we have left? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Do you have any more words?
for that. Um, I want to thank the panel, and if you'll join me in thanking Tibian, Fred, Annie, Mary, and Stephen. I want to thank you for coming along tonight and for spending this couple of hours with us and leaving you with Tibian's words of what will happen um, and thinking and remembering that stories teach us about our world, our place in them and who we are. So use your thoughts as artefacts, use your words as monuments and use the speech to build the architecture of your own fate. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you.